welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're out with world champion shot George Digweed and he doesn't shoot small black discs, he shoots large black birds. We're on this Somerset farm where rabbits are causing thousands of pounds worth of damage and we're sorting them out. But first, there's a new film out called Blooded and its trailer was so shocking they banned it from YouTube. We talk to the director. It's called Blooded. People assume it's a sort of horror film, reasonably. Um, it isn't. It's a thriller. Um, it's about a group of hunters who become hunted on a remote Scottish island called the Isle of Mull. Um, and the idea, which James Walker, the writer, will I'm sure tell you about, um, came from a deer stalking weekend that he went on where he was looking down the rifle scope at this deer uh, and the thought came into his head which was, you know, what if that was me? I was thinking to myself, either the person with the rifle is a very bad shot or they're a very good shot and they're trying to miss. What has been really interesting has been the reaction on the internet of people, of groups of individuals who haven't yet seen the film. Um, Part of the marketing campaign has been, by Revolver Entertainment, has been to generate an online presence for the fictitious animal rights group who are depicted in the film. Um, and the assumption on the internet has been that the film is pro-hunting. Um, we see it quite differently. We see it as a film that is a debate about the issues um, not just to do with hunting, but also to do with the politics of extremism. Uh, and also issues with the countryside in general. When I set out to write the idea of people being naked and being chased in that landscape, I was really aware that it had to be very sensual. You know, you, if you're writing that, and then, because what I put on the page, Ed was going to take and put on camera. So I needed to understand what it would feel like to be that kind of base animal when, actually, we're not a very good animal. We haven't got claws, we haven't got teeth. We, you know, strip us of guns and weaponry and leather and all that other stuff, and we're basically a soft, mushy pair on, on, a, on a hillside. Um, so actually, I did it myself. It was Nick, the producer's stag weekend, and um, we got a series of BB guns, really high-powered BB guns. And um, I got down into, it was in Wales, and I got down into my underwear, and, um, and I had a 30-second head start on a group of six of them with BB guns, and they shot me at point-blank range so I could feel what it was like. And it was, it just welt came up on my, on, on my, on my ass. And uh, so I decided that uh, this was something I did not want to repeat. And they gave me a head start, and I just flew. And it was an amazing feeling. And I, I ran, I ran for about, you know, about 20 minutes. They never, never touched me, because with, with no clothes on, actually. You're incredibly sort of freeing. Um, but I kind of got, there's a moment in the film where they talk about his feet being like plastic and, you know, that very sensory experience. And I didn't think I would have got that without having sort of done it for real. Obviously with BB guns, not live rounds, but... What was very appealing about the Isle of Mull and the prospect of filming there was the fact that you have production design by God. It looks amazing. Um, and anywhere you point the camera, it looks, you know, and, and that was one of the things about the film that really intrigued me was the fact that American films use the landscape all the time. Think about Thelma Louise or No Country for Old Men. And we wanted to make a film that was going to show off the British landscape um, in a way that we thought it deserved, in a way that you don't often see in films because British films, if you do see the landscape, it tends to be with a sort of horse and carriage riding across the shot. The first big problem was how do you, how do you make a stalk look A, convincing, and B, how can you get across the time scale of it? Because obviously in a film everything's hugely compressed, so we knew we had maybe a minute of screen time in which to show a stalk, and of course everyone on the island of Mull, it's, it's, they really want you to give a proper idea of a stalk. But you can't make a film for four and a half hours of, of a stalk, so that we, we did our very, very best to sort of to get the, the things accurate. Uh, I'm not sure we're entirely accurate. Like, you know, there's actually in, in there's one shot of when they're looking down the, the sniper scope, um, they see deer on the crest of a hill. And in fact, obviously, you wouldn't shoot deer on the crest of a hill. Um, but those were sort of liberties that we had to take because getting footage of deer in the right locations was very, very difficult. So that's actually stock footage that we're using there. Um, and then for the guns, we had a guy, he was on set with us and he was monitoring the guns at all times. Um, there is one shot where there is no bolt in the rifle because if he wasn't on set, we had to disarm the rifle by taking the bolt out and at one point, 
he wasn't there, we had to get the shot, so we just used it anyway. So for those of you who are really sort of gun fanatic, look for the shot where they're looking down the rifle and there's no bolt in it. Hunting cannot be excused. Hunting cannot be legal. This is the misery it brings. This is the misery it brings. It was just words on a page for me. God created us all equal. It didn't mean anything what it said. Give love to all creatures. I read it. I have been wrong all my life. And what's interesting is that people have seen the film and have come up to us and said, is it real? Right. Um, and the key thing is, I guess, from my point of view, is we're not trying to hoax people or trick people. That's not the intention at all. We've never said that the film is real. We've been quite clear that the film is fictitious. Um, the scary thing for me, I guess, is that if people could think it was real, the fact that there is that possibility in people's minds that extreme animal activists hunted a group of huntsmen on the Isle of Mull in 2005, the fact that could be believable says, I think, quite a lot about the world that we live in today. From the Scottish Highlands to the English Lowlands, where George Digweed is sorting out the Corvids. King George is back in the country after conquering the world. He has had an amazing start to the season, claiming his 18th World Championship in New Zealand and then heading to South Africa to win the Pan-African Cup. But there's no rest for the gifted, and as soon as he recovers from the jet lag, there's work to be done on his game shoot in East Sussex. Corvids are a big problem. They predate on young game birds and there are hundreds on what's left of the stubble from the cover crop. So what's the plan? We've got a massive crow roost the other side of the valley and for the last, oh I don't know, three weeks there's been quite a lot of crows using here. Uh, the game crop's about to be ploughed in um, for next year and um, I thought we'd just come take advantage of three hours on the crows uh, before the pheasants start nesting and all the young birds start, you know, getting into the nest because there's no question crows, jackdaws and that sort of thing do more damage um, to nesting birds than uh, most other animals put together. So, you know, if we can kill 30 or 40 on here, I feel as I've had a good afternoon. George is being joined today by Darren and Andrew from Idleback Chairs. George bought one of the original designs, but there's a new one which he's keen to try out. I'm a great believer in them. I think they're, they're fantastic chairs. You know, when you're actually sitting on it, you get full movement. <laughs> Once they're fully extended, you've got a, a nice height, a back to it. So you're sitting on the chair and wherever you want to turn to, you know, you can. And, and feet movement with shooting is key. It's 70% of, you know, what goes on. So being able to move your feet and turn your body to where you want to shoot means you can still shoot sitting down. And, you know, it's a... Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a comfortable thing to shoot off and it keeps you a bit more lower in the hide. And for crows, you know, you want to be as low as possible, really. George has set up Wish Team that. Idleback with some pigeon shooting at one end of the field. We are at the other in a hide he established a few days ago. So are there rules when it comes to decoying crows? I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any real rules apply crow-wise. Uh, you know, they are the most wary bird that you've got. You know, I, I think they're the most wary bird that you can shoot. But if you get plenty of decoys out there and you've got your hide set up cor correctly, they're also the dumbest. I've just got four, um, you know, crow decoys. And uh, I've got one dead bird here that I put on a flapper just to create a little bit of movement so that if they are coming into the decoys and they just see a little bit of movement, um, it keeps their mind looking at that rather than looking at me. Also joining today is sporting shooter editor Dom Holtam, who is doing a feature on the maestro. Thankfully, George has built a hide to cater for the entourage. With the decoy pattern set out, George gets out his precious Parazzi, which he's had ever since he signed up with the Italians. And of course, he's using his favourite game ball cartridges. I've got some black gold. I just, you know, I don't shoot anything too heavy a load. Uh, I've got some black gold that we had uh, 
that our clients were using during the pheasant season and uh, I should be using those today. Normally my preferred choice is Pigeon Extremes which I use for everything but I want to use these these uh, uh, shells up. Three leftovers. Yeah, well, pretty much really. George is a countryman and a sportsman. So where would he rather be? In New Zealand winning his 18th world title or in rural Sussex on a beautiful spring afternoon? I don't think there's I don't think there's any uh, any thrill that beats someone turning around and saying you're world champion. Um, you know, there's only a very few people that have have managed that, you know, in its entirety, and I'm very privileged to have done it more than once, and and you know, I never look never look away from that fact. But the countryside's my first love, and if I'm going to do something. I'd rather do it in the countryside with a wild animal, pit my wits against something. It's the hunter in you, really. Right, down to business and the shooting starts slowly. George wants to get a few just to fill out the pattern. You're saying you wanted to get a few more dead birds to increase the decoy pattern. You think that'll, that'll improve things? It's like anything, they're a gregarious bird. And, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of things as people, when they go pigeon shooting, um, you know, they go pigeon shooting and there's been five or six hundred pigeons on a field um, and they go out there and they put their half a dozen decoys out and expect the pigeons to decoy into them straight away. Well, it doesn't quite work like that because when a pigeon comes here, he's used to seeing five or six hundred pigeons here. Yeah. You know, consequently the same here, there's been three or four hundred crows on here for a few weeks. So when the crows come back here, they're looking to see three or four hundred crows on here, otherwise they're slightly wary because they think, hang on a minute, you know, why is there only eight or ten? All of which are static, not moving, so I've got two coming down the hedge here. Oh, hang on. Where are they, mothers? Oh, straight over it. Get them committed, then we'll have it a lot easier. Oh, he didn't like that. It's going to tower right above us. Oh, here we go, bro. Another one hit hard. He starts to get the birds, but George thinks the crows are now suspicious with dead ones lying on their backs. He and Dom head off for a tidy up. They say birds of a feather flock together. So is there a problem with George adding both crows and jackdaws to the pattern? They've been feeding together for you know a long period of time as I was talking about earlier on, so they're used to seeing some of each there. Uh, it's just, you know, they, it's quantity rather than just a few. And I always put a couple, I always put a couple there with their, their wings out just to indicate a little bit of movement. But, uh, you know, by picking those six or seven up, Everything we had coming here that I'd shot was upside down on its back out there, so not really going to be conclusive to getting more come in. As well as knocking over a few birds, George is also finding plenty of sport knocking Team Idleback's efforts in the pigeon hide. There is one right over the magnet. In fact, he's going to shoot the decoy on the magnet if he's not careful. No, they still didn't get it. Just getting worried about the size of your bag. Uh, how many have you got so far? Earth to idle, but <laughs> we're trying to concentrate here. We ain't got time to be chatting. George is getting really worried because he's heard that many gunshots. Uh, how many birds have you got? I thought the competition was to see how many shots you could take. 
<laughs> well, I definitely won definitely that. definitely winning that one. <laughs> I think we've about ten so far. Okay, that's not including the decoys, asking. Is that including the decoys, <laughs> George Osborne? <laughs> Obviously. We're from the Pigeon Preservation Association. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Best you old boys stick to making chairs, I think. Having improved relationships between North and South, George marches on and keeps hitting birds that might as well be in low orbit for other guns. However, it is apparently easier when there's less wind. The one thing about shooting on a still day as opposed to shooting on a windy day is the lines are straight. So you can kill stuff a bit further away uh, you can kill them further away because it's easier to read the line of what you're shooting at because there's not so much variation as there is in the wind you know I come through everything from behind touch it pull the trigger and keep the gun going I mean you know that pigeon there was a good 60 65 yards and uh, you know it was hit right in the head um, but it, it, on a day like today, I'd be confident of taking that shot every time, purely and simply because the, it's a stable line. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to take long shots on quite so much in a wind because of the variation in, you know, the bird's only got to tilt its wing and it's gone three or four yards in in a direction. Um, so, you know, that is a is something to to be you know to note. Um, but uh, but on a still day, it's you know it's nice. I mean we've you know a lot of what you've got on here has been 60 yard plus shots. I expected them to commit a little bit better than they have, but they they haven't really gone that. There's one there I could have shot, but uh, I mean shooting over your head. But then it also seems pretty straightforward shooting one handed while on the mobile. Um, yeah, uh, can you give me a call when you get the message, please? Thanks, bye. I absolutely sent a pattern that first shot, it nearly plucked it. <laughs> give me a smile, for goodness sake. Well, I can't believe it's gone in the tree over there. I'm going to pick it up in a minute. Oh. Please do not try this at home unless you are a world champion. Don wants to hear more pearls of wisdom from the master, but there's always another high bird to interrupt the flow. That's really interesting, George. When you say about you come through everything from behind, um, what you're saying is that it's the speed of the swing rather than the amount of lead. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like uh, if you shoot a rifle, you shoot at a target, don't know. Hang on. Dom gives it another go. Now, you stopped halfway through basically the really? secret of uh, successful shotgun shooting. Oh, perfect. Let's yeah. just leave it at that. <laughs> leave them hanging. Yeah. So you were saying that um, it's similar to rifle shooting, you have an aim point, and that is the head of the bird or the front of a clay target. Exactly I'm sorry, the same. I'll have to stop you there when I've got one coming. <laughs> Sorry, I did have one coming. <laughs> no, Jeremy packs when never has to put up with this, does he? Oh! Oh! <laughs> Please tell me you got that in. Oh! I don't care what happens now. How far do you think that was? Well, the first one was about 70 yards. I don't know how far the second one was. I wouldn't like to guess, but I can tell you now, he is a long way. Oh, I don't care what happens now. OK, Dom, why not change the subject? See if that works. So obviously we know that you've had a busy start to the competition year, George, but that literally started right off the back of the last drive of the last day of the game shooting season, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Uh, oh, hang on. 
Never mind. If you want George's undivided attention today, you need to be dressed in black and flying about 70 yards above his hide. So it's all starting to work for George. How is the idle back performing? Well, it's got a, a cushioned seat on it, which is fantastic, especially when you've got an arse as big as mine. Um, it's a lot more comfortable. Uh, it's got a good swivel system to it. You know, the, 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 the thing I like about the guys is that uh, they're not doing something and doing it their way and their way is the right way and it's the only way. They're actually getting out, getting involved in the field um, and trialling stuff and, and, and asking people their opinions on it, which is the right way to go because, you know, if you want a product to succeed, you've got to have a product that the shooters want and the shooters can use. It's time to call it a day. The bag looks pretty respectable given our late start. Handy for George as he has plans for a few of the birds. Uh, crows don't like having, you know, where they're feeding, their mates hung up by their feet. Uh, hence the reason why when you're travelling throughout the country, you know, quite often you'll see fields of new sown barley or peas or whatever with uh, crows hanging up upside down on them. And um, what I do is, if I have a day like this, I keep I keep some uh, crows back and put them in the freezer, and then uh, if I've got uh, if I've got somewhere where crows are doing the damage, I haven't got to go out, you know, and spend time. If I'm in the middle of the clay season or whatever, I can just go and hang stuff up there straight away. So I've got them in stock. Team Idleback has also had an enjoyable day, even though George thinks they should stick to making chairs and not pest control. Uh, we're constantly uh, looking to, for ways and means of improving it and we always listen to feedback all the time and I can't teach this guy anything. Um, you know, I'm, I have a great deal of respect for him and you know, anything that I can learn or pick up from him, um, you know, we listen to everything. So uh, whether it's George or um, just a guy on a, one of his uh, trade stands sort of thing, uh, we listen to everyone. So, um, and then we go away and try and incorporate any ideas that come along. So we've now got pigeon chairs. Um, we've, we've also just done a new version where you, you can detach the front end very, very simply by the removal of one screw from the original rifle chair. Um, so that's a new one. Just after we designed that just after Newark, and um, so you know we're, we're constantly trying to evolve things on it. It has been a real education shooting crows with George today, and although we never really got the definitive answer of how to shoot the digweed way, we did discover that he is on fire in 2011. Let's leave that Covid catastrophe and go to Somerset for a bunny bonanza. It's all gone black. We need magic eyes. We've put an N550 digisight onto Somerset farmer Richard Payne's 22 rifle and he's out after rabbits. The great thing about night vision is that they come running towards you. All you need to do is sit and wait. And if you have a team of willing helpers such as Richard's son Will and a friend, Clive, you can take the whole thing mobile and cover much more of the farm. So this is fun. But it is not until daytime that you see the extent of the damage to the farm and just how seriously Richard has to take rabbit control. You've obviously got a bit of a problem with rabbits here. Uh, yes, we have. On this side of the farm it is terrible. Um, it is on a boundary um, and we do get a lot of rabbits coming over from the neighbour but we do have our, you know, uh, our own um, fair share and our own hedges. Um, this should be a field of a winter oilseed rape which was drilled in the end of August last year. Um, it's a 21-acre field, and we've only got five acres left um, as a winter rape crop, which you can see over my shoulder. And the remainder we've had to drill about two weeks ago with a spring rape crop. So that's 16 acres of rape lost to rabbits? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, normally the rabbits, um, in my experience, will always go for wheat. Um, we had the problem with the, with the preceding wheat crop here last year, um, and I think they took about two tonnes an acre. Um, and so we put some rape in here thinking we'll, you know, it would give us time to get on top of the rabbits, but they, it's the first time I've ever seen rabbits on this farm mow down a, f a field of rape. And in terms of farm incomes, I mean this is just one field on the farm, but what is, what is 16 acres of rape in terms of yield? Well 16 acres is, I mean we did two tonnes an acre last year, so um, you know that's 
30 odd tonnes of rape and the market at the moment is about £350 a tonne. So, well, what do we know? Do the math, 10,000 quid? Something like that. So the yes. rabbits have eaten 10,000 pounds worth of rape in this field alone? In this field alone. And we have one other field where they have taken about five acres. And so I'm now sort of doing an integrated approach, really, to rabbit control. And um, around this field now, we've got a nice big, shiny, new permanent rabbit fence uh, at some considerable expense. But um, we shoot them hard, we ferret them hard. I've even got a rodinator, which makes me feel good. I'm not quite sure how good it is um, at, at actually controlling rabbits, but I think that if you have a three or four pronged attack, we are slowly going to get on top of them. Sometimes you don't know which to choose, and when you do choose one, the shot does not always go according to plan. There, surely that's a dead rabbit. Nope, off it goes, a clean miss. Night vision is a skill you have to learn. Richard sat and watched these two for five minutes before realising they were clods of earth. Then there are eyes that light up, but there's something wrong with them. Happily, Will puts the beam on them and they turn out to be roe deer sitting in the field by a wood. Or this, is it a rabbit? No, it's a hare. It's hard to judge distance and even angle in the dark, though the bars on the reticle help with distance. We measured this miss at 100 yards and 20 feet below us. Sometimes it doesn't go according to plan, but most of the time it does. This rabbit's a goner, and the faithful retriever does his work. Looks like the dogs will be getting rabbit again tomorrow. Just a few thousand to go. Richard, Will and Clive have got their work cut out. Well, we're back next week. This has been Field Sports Britain, shooting everything this week. Rabbits, Corvids, Antis.